Hello. Hi, everyone. Merhaba. Um, I'm going to wait a few beats just to let um, people trickle in. Um, we'll get started really soon. Uh, would someone mind chatting in the chat box and letting me know that I am coming through and audible to everybody? I'll look for your chat there. Hey, thank you, Victor. Awesome. Okay, cool. Uh, I'll then just maybe pause about 30 seconds and then we can jump into it. But thanks for uh, joining us. Okay, great. Um, I can go ahead then and and uh, get started um, and uh, welcome you to the language specific information session for the CLS Turkish program and the CLS Azerbaijani program. Uh, my name is Bo Knudsen and I'm the senior program officer for Turkish, Azerbaijani, Swahili and Portuguese at the CLS program. So sort of a mixed bag of languages. Um, I'm joined by uh, two alumni today um, who we're lucky to have. Um, Isabel Davis, who is an alumna of the 2021 Turkish program, uh, the virtual program, and also by Chelsea Cervantes Dubois, who is an alumna of the 2019 Azerbaijani program. Uh, I believe Chelsea is, is on her way and she's gonna join us in just one minute. But um, I will um, uh, give Isabel a brief opportunity now to just introduce herself. Uh, maybe, uh, Isabel, if you want to just uh, unmute and just kind of uh, let everybody know uh, where you applied from, for CLS from, uh, you know, your university, and maybe a little bit about what you're doing now. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Isabel Davis. I study at the University of Iowa. That's where I applied from. I'm still a student. I'm waiting. Uh, hopefully next semester, I'll be able to go to Azerbaijan with a Boren Award to study Turkish more. Um, and I'm a virtual intern with uh, Education USA Azerbaijan. Wonderful. Uh, thanks, thanks, Isabel. Those are uh, great things you're up to and kind of applying your language skills. And so, you know, maybe later on uh, in the presentation, if you want to share a little bit about how you connected some of those dots, that would be uh, really great. Um, so um, I'm looking through the uh, attendee list and Chelsea's not here just yet, but we have a slide for Chelsea a little bit later. So we'll have a chance for her to introduce herself in just a, a few minutes. Okay, so um, we're going to uh, start with an overview uh, of what we're gonna be talking about. Um, we'll provide some details about the CLS program in general, kind of just give you the big picture uh, of what the CLS program entails. Uh, we'll give you uh, more details about the CLS Turkish program and the CLS Azerbaijani program. Um, we will uh, talk through some of the benefits of the program. We will hear from uh, Isabel and Chelsea about their experiences. Um, so again, Chelsea is an alumna of the Azerbaijani program, the in-person program, and Isabel is an alumna of the virtual program from just this year. So they'll have different perspectives that could be really useful for us. Uh, we'll also talk about the application process. Um, go through some general tips on how to apply, how to put together a competitive application. And at the end, we'll answer any questions that you have about the presentation, the program, or the application process. Um, we're going to be answering questions throughout the presentation, 
um, if they're relevant to uh, the topic or if it's like clarifying information. I'll try to catch them as we go. But uh, most of the questions I'll probably wait until the end to answer in the Q&A box. So feel free to just throw them in the chat or the Q&A box and we'll get to them towards the end. If your question is really uh, particular or specific to your circumstances, uh, I'll answer it individually or um, you know, suggest that maybe we get in touch uh, by email. Um, okay, so let's start out just with an overview. What is CLS? Uh, the CLS is a fully funded st summer study abroad program. It supports US students in all fields of study to learn what the US Department of State calls critical languages. Critical languages are languages that are undertaught and underspoken in the United States. And they're languages where, frankly, the United States wants to increase its resources of speakers who speak these languages, not only for government work, but across all sectors uh, of the economy um, in many different fields. So they just want more speakers of these languages to strengthen uh, the US as a country. Turkish and Azerbaijani are just two of the 15 languages offered through the CLS program. Um, if you are interested in learning the other languages, you can go to our website. Nine of the 15 languages, including Turkish and Azerbaijani, are offered at the beginner level. So probably the most exciting and thing about the CLS program that often gets overlooked is that it is fully funded by the US government. The program covers domestic travel from each participant's home um, and international travel uh, overseas to the uh, program location, the institute site. Uh, where you have a, a orientation on site, as well as round trip international airfare back uh, to your uh, host co home community. Um, I'm going to pause here. Chelsea's having an issue logging in. So I'll just take uh, 20 seconds really quick. So forgive me, I'll be right back. Actually, I can pause um, a little bit down, down uh, the presentation uh, and give Isabel a chance to talk, um, and then uh, we can let Chelsea in. But um, we'll just kind of go ahead uh, through these slides now. Um, alumni of the program receive um, undergraduate credit through Bryn Mawr College, as well as a certificate, uh, an actual certificate that, that confirms an OPI score. OPI is Oral Proficiency Index. And you get a certificate that sort of verifies your language level post program after you test out. The program also covers ap applicable visa fees, as well as the cost of tuition, room and board, cultural excursions and activities in the host country. So um, proficiency in a foreign language opens a lot of doors and helps you stand out to employers. You're here and so you're motivated to apply for CLS already, but I wanted to make a pitch for each language uh, on this slide. So why study Turkish? Over 75 million people speak Turkish as their first language, and this makes it one of the globe's 15 most widely spoken first languages. There are large communities of speakers of Turkish in the Balkans and the Caucasus and in Central Asia and very large Turkish immigrant communities in Western Europe. Uh, for example, Turkish is the second most widely spoken language in Germany. Another 15 million people speak Turkish as a second language. The Republic of Turkey is strategically connected geographically and culturally to Eastern Europe, Central Asia, and the Middle East. So uh, knowledge of Turkish is advantageous to anyone interested in international business or politics of Turkey or the surrounding regions, as Turkey continues to develop as a global economic power. Turkish belongs to a language family that includes 30 Turkic languages spoken in Eastern Europe, Central Asia, and Siberia, including Uzbek, Kazakh, Uyghur, Kyrgyz, Turkmen, and Tatar. The differences among these languages are much smaller than their close similarities. Um, uh, and knowledge of Turkish opens up uh, a lot of doors and uh, sort of uh, perspectives into a region of uh, very vast geopolitical significance and reach. And linguistically, it's a gateway and foundation for accessing those other Turkic languages spoken by millions of people in the countries of Central Asia, the Middle East, and the Caucasus. Uh, Azerbaijani is an example of a Turkic language related to Turkish um, that, you know, uh, is sort of in this family of Turkic languages that, that we're, we're talking about. There's very few people in America who learn or speak Azerbaijani who are not native speakers. It's a specialized, unique, and valuable language to know. 
Those who learn Azerbaijani may apply it in a variety of fields and careers in business, consulting, translation, and interpreting. Foreign service and intelligence or journalism are also fields uh, where Azerbaijani is really valued. Azerbaijan is the largest and most populous country in the South Caucasus and possesses sizable reserves of oil resources. Um, there's um, uh, Azerbaijani is sort of connected through its energy uh, trend, uh, business relationships uh, with Russia and many countries um, in the region, and it plays a really large role in that region's foreign policy. Um, the United States is Azerbaijan's most prominent trade partner, and so you know it's it's quite useful if you're interested in uh, business or in developing um, sort of uh, your uh, regional expertise. For both Turkish and Azerbaijani, uh, these unique qualities translate into interesting jobs and fields and careers and scholarship funds for students who are committed to learning them. Um, I maybe then can, um, let's maybe pause here. Uh, Isabel, would you mind kind of just sharing a little bit about um, Turkish and your interest in Turkish and maybe um, you know, your perspective on, on how, how it's useful? Um, and if you could do that, then I'll, um, I'll see if I can uh, let Chelsea into the webinar. Definitely. Um, I became interested in Turkish in 2016 when I was studying at the University of Iowa's academic summer program in high school. And my roommate and my friends all happened to be Turkish and they exposed me to the language. And that was the same year, or it was the same during which the coup d'etat, attempted coup d'etat happened. And I saw for the first time that events that happened on the news happened to real people and happened in real life. Um, and for me, that's the reason that I st started studying Turkish, but in my cohort, at least, it was very diverse. Everybody's reason was unique and personal to them. So for example, we had somebody who was an archeologist and so they were studying like history of the country and everything like that. And then we had people who are heritage speakers learning so that they could speak to their grandparents. Um, and we had people who were studying um, LGBT communities in the Mediterranean. Um, and queer code languages in Turkey. So there is a reason for any person to learn it. And it's a way for us to connect with people in the United States, as well as people in Turkey. Um, another reason for me uh, would be I'm a translator or I'm trying to be a translator. And so Turkish literature and poetry um, has been like a way for me to connect with uh, different type or different Turkish people as well as their um, media. So, or even like news and things like that, if you're um, a news academic, I guess, um, studying how the government influences um, television and news and everything like that, lots of different ways. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Yeah, it's, it's uh, you make some really great points. Uh, it's interesting to hear about your path. And um, uh, one of the points that I want to emphasize is just the really diverse um, cohort that we always have for CLS Turkish. People are coming from very different perspectives, very different interests in uh, the region and in the language. And so, you know, that, that can be something that's really valuable and interesting to, to also learn about and explore and program through the perspectives of uh, other uh, members of the CLS cohort that you're that you're in. Um, yeah, so Chelsea, um, would you like to um, briefly um, unmute uh, if you could maybe just say uh, where you're coming from and you know when you did CLS uh, and which language and um, also if you want to jump in and kind of just say uh, why Azerbaijani, you know what what about Azerbaijani um, brought you to uh, apply for CLS. Um, we're also just in this slide making a broad pitch for for uh, Turkish and Azerbaijani. Um, so you can go ahead and unmute and uh, be happy to hear it from you. Thank you, Bo. Oh, uh, how can I show my video or I can't? If I can't, that's fine too. Um, okay, so uh, the I studied Azerbaijani in 2019 and during the CLS program. I am currently a PhD student and I'm gonna be defending my dissertation actually next week. So I will not be a student any longer. Um, the reason why I studied Azerbaijani is because my dissertation research and my master's research was focused on Azerbaijan, on specifically Turkey and the Caucasus. 
And I needed, the reason why I applied to CLS specifically is because at that stage, I already spoke superior level Turkish uh, and Russian, but my Azerbaijani speaking was good, but my writing and reading was poor. So my motivation to join the program or to apply for the program was to get that intensive grammar uh, training as well as practice speaking properly using correct Azerbaijani um, sentences, not mixing it with Russian nor Turkish, which I had this really bad habit of doing. Um, so uh, for those of you who are not a graduate student or for those of you who are thinking about graduate school in the coming years or in the near future, what I encourage you to think about too, um, when it comes to Azerbaijani specifically, is that Azerbaijani cohort that I was a part of, there was a larger group of students in the first year, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, beginner level and intermediate level. And I uh, was the only one at the advanced level, but uh, given the fact that I already uh, had been to Azerbaijan several times and I already had a specific reason why in that program. Now, the my cohort that was in the first year, I think they gained so much um, never knowing anything about Azerbaijan or Azerbaijani language. Uh, and it was a unique cohort. One student, he had a strong interest in the Ottoman history of Azerbaijan and its influence. For those of you who are, are not aware, Azerbaijani has a more of a Ottoman Turkish uh, dialect and words uh, where Turkish is more modern, as they would say. Um, they are similar, but they are very different in that way. And another individual in my cohort had a fascination with Azerbaijani poetry. So they wanted to learn Azerbaijani. Um, so what I encourage you to think about too, it's a great language and CLS is wonderful for this, is coming in as a first year, not knowing a language and coming out knowing so much more than you would imagine, given the intensity of um, classes every day with the grammar, your language partner, having activities and the excursions. So for that, it's wonderful. Um, regarding the the in-country experience if you have that opportunity in the upcoming CLS applications or programs that will be offered I think it's a wonderful experience um, because of the wonderful way that the host families are arranged as well as the excursions they put you on and that's when you get to have everyday practice tell me if I missed anything Bo but I think I covered all those points great yeah no thank you that that was all um great and I think that um helped provide some perspective on, you know, different folks paths to studying Azerbaijani and, you know, how, how really it is it accessible as a beginner level language too, um, if you really kind of want to get started on that, on that road uh, and learn more about Azerbaijan as you as you experience it. Um, we'll have a chance a little bit later um, to dive into some other topics too. Um, we'll have a slide, um, Chelsea, where you can kind of dig into other things more, more related to on program experiences, but thanks for for that contribution now. Um, so I can uh, just uh, direct you to the box on the right here. Um, so Turkish and Azerbaijani are both offered at beginner levels. Um, if you have some experience with Turkish or Azerbaijani and you're trying to determine you know, what level to apply for for CLS, you can go ahead and um, on the application, you can look to see you know, which level might be best for you. But basically, um, you know, here is kind of a rough guide. So if you have a one year of study, or the, its equivalent, you might apply for advanced beginner, um, two years intermediate, advanced three years plus. Um, but there is a little bit more developed criteria on that application to help you understand what to apply for. Um, yeah, um, I can go ahead and jump to the next slide. Uh, the Turkish program in uh, Turkey is hosted by Ankara University Tomer, um, which is a CLS partner based in Ankara which is Turkey's capital and the second largest city in the country, with a population of 4.5 million. Ankara University is a public federally funded institution. And this was really the first university in Turkey founded after the formation of the modern Turkish state in 1923. Uh, today, Ankara University is an international research university with 40 vocational programs, 120 undergrad programs, and 110 graduate programs. Tomer is uh, our partner there. Uh, it's an acronym for Turkçe Öğretim Merkezi, or Turkish Teaching Center. It was founded in 1984, and it really was the first Turkish higher ed institution to teach Turkish to international students. It remained the only such institution in Turkey until the mid-90s. They have an extremely experienced and driven uh, collective of teachers, language partners, and staff, and it's a really welcoming place to, to study Turkish. Um, 
the Azerbaijani uh, Institute is hosted by Azerbaijan University of Languages, or AUL, the host of the CLS uh, Virtual Institute in 2021. But as a partner, uh, our partnership with AUL goes all the way back to 2009, when Azerbaijani was first offered. AUL is located in Baku, the capital of Azerbaijan, and AUL is the country's leading institution in education of ling linguists and international relations experts. Uh, the teachers at AUL and many of the language partners are really experienced. This also is true for the host families. And um, many of the teachers and students uh, work with the uh, foreign languages department or the international relations department. So they have international perspectives and experience working with non Azerbaijani speakers. Their enthusiasm uh, for working with CLS students to improve their language skills, uh, in addition to the really uh, friendly and hospitable nature of Azerbaijani culture, really makes for a great program experience um, for CLS students. Uh, I want to run through some of the key aspects of the CLS program, um, just to highlight them uh, so that you have them in mind uh, as you think about applying. So the CLS program is more than just a funding opportunity for you to go and do language study. It's an all-inclusive study abroad program focused on immersive language learning, and it's a group program. Uh, each of our partner institutes hosts up to 30 CLS scholars and facilitates an intensive eight-week program for students that includes 20 classroom hours of language instruction each week, cultural activities, local, uh, local excursions, and one or two week overnight weeknight trips. The program is academically rigorous, and every aspect is designed to maximize language gains and your immersion in the host culture. Throughout the summer, students agree only to speak the language that they're studying in the classroom, on cultural activities, and with their host family, uh, even if they are absolute beginners. Uh, beginners do get a grace period of about two weeks um, to learn uh, essential classroom phrases um, and you know, uh, basic phrases to help them navigate everyday life. But after that two weeks period, we do ask students to try and speak the target language all the time. Uh, also, each student is assigned a language partner for practice outside of the classroom. The language partner um, usually is a uh, uh, student or young person um, related, uh, either a student at the university or a recent graduate. Uh, sometimes they are other members of the community. They go through an application and interview process to be selected and Really, their goal is to expose you to cultural traditions and to give you regular language practice that's informal outside of the classroom. Um, so uh, on program, you have an opportunity to kind of build a, a relationship with your language partner, um, learn more about them. Uh, oftentimes that relationship provides a window into the larger culture and helps you understand, um, you know, different people's lives, um, uh, you know, in, in uh, Azerbaijan or in Turkey. Participants meet with the language partners twice a week, usually for one hour each, uh, for a total of minimum two hours a week to get informal language practice and get exposed to modern cultural traditions, youth culture, and anything they want to explore with that language partner. We also have a cultural activities program component on the CLS program, where participants regularly participate in activities organized by the host institute. These activities include, may include uh, uh, tours of uh, important historical and cultural landmarks, museums. Um, these tours and and uh, uh, will be in the target language. Participants also meet with representatives of the community, including artisans, musicians, and businessmen, representatives from social organizations, to help give them different perspectives and windows into that uh, into the host culture. Um, and alumni of the program join a vibrant and engaged community of U.S. Department of State International Exchange alumni and gain access to a lot of resources uh, provided by the U.S. Department of State to that community and events sponsored by the CLS program and the U.S. Depart Department of State alumni uh, organization. Um, Chelsea, I just want to maybe ask on, on the in-person program, uh, in your mind, were there any cultural activities that really stood out as um, meaningful or, 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 or fun? Well, I love them all, to be very honest. Um, but I do think one uh, activity that I thought was great, uh, for myself even, given the fact that I've been in and out of Azerbaijan for about a decade, 
the tour of the different religious um, centers. So we went to a synagogue, we went to a Catholic church, we went to a Orthodox church, and we went to a mosque. I thought that was wonderful because it shows the, the diversity of religions in Azerbaijan, and specifically in Baku, but also gave a really uh, unique insight to the um, religious leaders, um, perspective of the community and their challenges as well as their contributions. So I thought that was unique because that's not something I have encountered in a predominantly Islamic country in my own experience. So that one really stood out to me as very unique. And I thought that was wonderful. CLS was able to arrange that. Another one that I absolutely love that was really fun and it allowed our group to bond even more together uh, was going to the villages in Khanalur, no, near in the north, near the uh, Dagestani border, so close to Russia. It was fun because we got to sleep uh, in, uh, we were hosted, so we were in a household and we were hosted um, by a couple, I believe they've been doing it for several years. They gave us a traditional uh, meals as well, tea, we also got to explore and hike in the, the, the village and outside the village. So for me, that was wonderful too, because we got to be, a, we one got to speak Azerbaijani and got a little tour of the town, but also too, we got to be aware of the different ethnic groups. Cause that's something I think sometimes uh, when you learn a language and you're not in country, you're not aware always or informed, there are ethnic groups in these communities or these countries that you, you study the predominant language. So this community we were with had their own ethnic language in addition to Azerbaijani. And they even had books in their store showing their own language and teaching their children both languages at the same time. So those, those really stuck out to me and those were really fun experiences. Very cool. Yeah, thanks for sharing those um, uh, memories of those uh, activities and excursions. Um, yeah, I think that a lot of the activities um, uh, from a distance might seem uh, like activities that, you know, uh, you, you might be sort of typical, like going to museums or uh, visiting landmarks, but the CLS program always tries to have added value to create conversations uh, with individuals and representatives uh, of those institutions or those places to really kind of uh, allow for language practice and allow students to, to you know, have conversations and and discuss the meaning of, 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 of uh, the experiences that they're having. Um, can jump to the next slide. Next slide, um, I want to talk through a little bit uh, the virtual program uh, because you know we have had two years uh, in a row of uh, CLS virtual um, because of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so depending on health and safety considerations, it may be necessary to hold some or all of the 2022 CLS institutes virtually. Uh, this decision has not been made yet and won't get made until early next year. Um, but in any case, uh, the virtual program follows a very similar structure to the CLS in-person program, emphasizing the language, cultural learning, and building relationships between CLS scholars and the people of the host country. Uh, in the case of the 2021 virtual program, participants had 10 hours of language study per week. Uh, so it's a little bit different than the, uh, the in-person program, a little bit uh, less, uh, but it is 10 uh, hours of synchronous uh, Zoom classes. Uh, they do meet with a language partner. Uh, they do have a cultural activities program. Um, the students in the virtual program um, uh, also uh, participate in activities and excursions and have conversations with people from the host community. Um, this might take the form of guest lectures by local craftsmen, virtual visits to markets and places of business, representatives, uh, conversations with representatives from NGOs, religious leaders, and exposure to cultural traditions through music, art, and dance. Um, Isabel, I wanted to give you a chance if, um, to mention anything uh, uh, that stood out to you from uh, the virtual program, whether it's language partner relationship or uh, some cultural activities that you thought were, were cool in a virtual context. Yeah, we had a lot of interesting cultural activities and our coordinator did a great job of um, trying to create more content for us to learn and have more contact hours with the language. So he um, would go and interview local business owners and we got to do Q and A's with them. Um, we also had a, the one that stood out to me really was this organic farmer 
and um, I'm from Iowa, so I had to ask him, you know, um, about the challenges of being an organic farmer in Turkey, and um, and so that was like a really interesting experience. We also had a virtual tour of a mosque and um, being able to ask questions to an imam. Um, uh, yeah, so there were a lot of different kinds of experiences. I think that we also had um, an interview with somebody who was an econo uh, economist uh, and she was a woman. So hearing that perspective as well, being a woman in Turkey, um, studying uh, the social sciences and things like that. So there were a lot of opportunities to talk to um, Turkish people and learn from them. Great. Uh, thanks, Isabel. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, there, there, um, uh, there are challenges, obviously, um, uh, with um, moving everything over into a virtual format, but I think the CLS program has a lot of, had a lot of successes, and we're really able to keep a lot of the really great things about the program in a virtual uh, environment. So, um, you know, uh, I think that uh, as we uh, approach next year's programs, we'll have a lot more clarity uh, in late winter, probably uh, about what the program will look like. Uh, the identity of the CLS program is an in-person program, and we are eager to return to in-person programming. So when you apply, you would be applying uh, for the CLS program for the in-person program. You wouldn't need to cater your application for a virtual context. Um, you would then be, uh, you know, be able to make the decision later down the road whether whether you know, you'd want to do a virtual program if it ends up being virtual. Uh, we can talk this through a little bit more in the Q&A though too. Okay, so um, in addition to the opportunity to study abroad and take intensive language classes on a fully funded program, there's lots of other benefits that come from participating in CLS. Um, students on program make substantial gains in language proficiency over the course of the summer. And professional, proficiency in a foreign language, uh, especially a critical language, that's in demand in the United States really opens a lot of doors for further academic and employment opportunities across all fields. Studying abroad also helps uh, participants hone skills that employers are looking for, like problem solving, flexibility, and adaptability. All of these things can help you stand out to employers uh, to give you an edge in an increasingly competitive and globalized job market and give you good talking points um, for that job interview uh, for some of those questions where you have to speak from your own personal experiences. Because of the immersive nature of the CLS program, participants also have the opportunity to build meaningful relationships with their host communities and also with CLS participants in their cohort. So um, a lot of times these relationships kind of um, our participants do return to country to visit um, their uh, teachers and uh, uh, host families and people they met on program and also make connections with other CLS participants across the country. Uh, because they often share common interests and common, perhaps common career paths too. Uh, alumni of the program join a vibrant and engaged community of U.S. Department of State International Exchange alumni and gain access to a lot of resources and events supported by the program. We'll talk us through some of those resources and benefits uh, in a couple slides. CLS participants do not have a service requirement to the U.S. government, unlike programs like Boren. Um, after the completion of the program, um, basically we ask you to do a survey. That's about all. You have to do a language test and a survey. Alumni do receive a certificate of non-competitive eligibility for federal employment after the CLS program, which is a big benefit. The application is available now and online at CLS scholarship backslash apply. In order to prepare a competitive application, we recommend that you start early and reach out to resources on your campus for help. Uh, must be submitted no later than uh, 8 p.m. Eastern Time on Tuesday, November 16th. That's 5 p.m. Pacific Time. You can you apply for only one language. Uh, so please keep in mind that you also apply for a language rather than a location. So um, in your application material, do you want to apply for Turkish, um, not going to Ankara, Turkey? Uh, the uh, location of the site um, usually stays the same across all languages each year. But it can change due to political uh, uh, situation on the ground or safety concerns. So be sure to apply for Turkish as you make your argument in your essays. Um, 
Applicants are required to submit an unofficial transcript and one recommendation letter. Um, you basically go to this section of the application, you enter the email address and the, the title, the name of this person that you want to ask a recommendation letter from, and you hit send. You can ask for that recommendation letter before you submit the application, but you should give them a heads up and talk to them beforehand to make sure that they're okay and understand uh, what it, being a recommender entails. Um, four short essays and a statement of purpose make up the application. Um, we have a slide uh, that we're going to talk about some tips about how to answer some of those questions um, and submit the most the best and most competitive application possible. Um, I want to give Chelsea an opportunity now to kind of just talk a little bit about um, uh, herself, her experiences on program, and um, maybe um, a little bit about, you know, how her language skills connect with what she's up to now. Um, Chelsea, if you could take maybe three or four minutes and uh, uh, talk a little bit. Um, and, uh, you know, any, any other insights or, or tips that you want to give participants to, or uh, I'm sorry, tips or insights you want to give webinar attendees as well, that might be helpful. Yeah, I'd love to. So the first thing I would like to highlight um, a little bit of my interaction with CLS before the Azerbaijani program, I applied about, I think, four or five times. <laughs> and I'm saying that because I want you to realize that every year there's a different pool of applicants and every language has a different pool of applicants. So I originally applied when I was in my master's program for Turkish. Now I was an alternate both times. The reason being from now understanding CLS program more and who applies, it prob my assumption, but it's, it's probably a strong assumption and Bo can interject at any time, but it was probably because I was too advanced in my Turkish language skills at that point. And it could have been the, the students that applied the kind of cohort they wanted to shape that year. So what I wanna emphasize with that little mini story is the fact that it has nothing to do with your qualifications or what you are, it's more of that cohort who would apply that year and what that program's looking for. Now, I also applied for Russian and then I applied for Azerbaijani and I did get it, but I had to decline it because I was offered another opportunity a month ahead of CLS notifications. And so CLS encouraged me to do what is best for me because they cannot say anything at that point. So then, but they did say, please consider applying again next year if you cannot accept this year or cannot wait a month. And so that's what I did. I did apply uh, again, and then I was fortunate enough to get it again. And so I, I eventually embarked on CLS with Oscar Jenny. Now I'm telling you that because for several reasons, uh, if let's say, let's say you studied Russian and you applied for Russian once or twice and you didn't get it, I would encourage you to think more of what's your motivation to apply to a certain language and what is the goal after the program. And I say that because CLS, the intention of it is to continue language learning post-program. And if you, let's say you want to, you know, have this experience, you want to learn, you don't have much experience abroad anyways, you want to have exposure to learning a language, you want to develop those skill sets, but you're, you're not quite sure why Indonesian, for example, or why first year Azerbaijani, right? Now, I would encourage you to think about it this way. When you start learning a new language, you're learning different modes of thinking and patterns. And so this is a great opportunity to learn time management, uh, collaboration with student groups, communication skills. So there's a lot of things that you can develop through an entry level course, beginning level with a language you don't know. Same thing with Turkish. So those are things I want you to think about because it doesn't mean you have to, like I, would say it's sometimes people will ask me, well, you are an expert in the region and you've been doing this for many years. That is an exception, but in, on the larger scale of things, this is a great opportunity for somebody who wants to start um, learning languages and start being engaged in learning new skills. So I would encourage you to think about it in that way. Now, uh, regarding tips and tricks, one of the things that I did when I was eager to apply to CLS and then multiple times that I did, I attend the web, I attended the webinars. The webinars are very helpful. Yes, they give you slides and the rundown of the program, but what I think was the most fruitful experience of those webinars were the Q&As. The Q&As is where everybody would drop in their questions and there would be different responses and answers. And I would not only attend one webinar, I would attend several. 
And I like that because it gave me diversity of present presenters, exposure to the presenters. They had different responses and every session had different questions. So I would encourage you to attend them because they only help you perfect your application. Now, the intentions of you getting the, uh, the winning the CLS or having a strong chance, CLS wants you to apply, CLS wants you to succeed. So there's many, many resources that are available to everybody. There are webinars, there are online sources, there are YouTube videos that CLS has recorded to guide you. I think Bo has his stardom there on YouTube. I remember watching it when I applied. So I encourage you to use those resources. This is, this is not a walk in a dark room. This is very much helping you to understand what CLS wants, how CLS wants you to present that, uh, tips and tricks that they, they have provided other applicants in the past. So there's a lot of resources. There's also alumni such as myself, uh, ambassadors such as myself. Also universities do have a representative, a seat that helps you with the application. I can say at my university where, uh, University of Minnesota uh, is where I ended up winning CLS, but I also went to UW Madison, University of Wisconsin Madison for my master's in undergrad. Now, both places had a fellowship office and they had a representative who was in charge of, or who is exposed to, or meets with Bo or attends these webinars about um, the CLS program itself. Now that individual on my campus was so helpful. They advised me where to go for certain specialists to review drafts of my application. They gave me suggestions on things to think about, what they've noticed in the CLS program from their end, being a representative um, for CLS at the university. So I encourage you to talk to those individuals and to reach out to them. And I believe Bo can interject anytime, but I believe CLS provides information where you can find out who that is at your university. I think so. I know Fulbright did that in the past, but I think CLS also does that. Um, so I encourage you to talk to those people as well. Also, reads, have people read your drafts. Do not be shy. I have a joke that I, my first draft is usually a word vomit. It's just putting everything on paper, making bullet points, thinking through the questions, what you know, examples do I have to talk about? And then starting to refine it and just writing out those examples and then cleaning it. And then I would go to, if you have at your university, a writing center. They're great. Sometimes, especially with COVID times, they have them online as well as in person. I have been there many, many times on my own at, at my level as well. I encourage you to also have um, alumni or people you know read them, uh, mentors, your representative at the university. I, I even myself, my cohort, uh, one of them, Two of them actually applied to something and asked me to review their essays. So I was more than happy to guide them and suggest what they should consider when applying. So I encourage you to think about those aspects of the CLS program when applying. Um, yes, go ahead, Bo. No, no, no. I, I wanted to thank you, Chelsea, for, for all these great tips. Um, but I, I did want to um, give us time for, for Isabel and also uh, plenty of time for Q&A too, though. Sure, sure. Um, that's um, about it. So if you want me to say anything about myself, I'm happy to do it or I can wait until the Q&A. Okay, uh, great. Yeah, I think we, um, uh, we we could keep moving a little bit, uh, just in case I do see questions. And I think actually a lot of these topics may, may end up, you know, raising more questions um, from the attendees. So, um, but thanks for all those great tips. Uh, I can really, uh, you know, emphasize that uh, Chelsea ran through a lot of awesome uh, tips for applying, including checking out all the resources application tips video, getting different eyes on your applications, um, finding an advisor uh, on your campus if they are, there is one, and I can kind of um, uh, point you in that direction uh, in the Q&A too. Um, but uh, real quick, um, maybe we could also jump over to uh, hear from Isabel in terms of her um, uh, experiences on the program, um, really kind of what she found to be uh, the benefits of CLS and maybe how it's impacted what she's doing now. Um, Isabel, I'm sorry, I don't have a picture for you. Uh, so I threw this picture of one of the um, virtual uh, group meetings with uh, 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 Turkish students uh, on this slide, but um, sorry about not having a picture. <laughs> Did you want to go ahead and um, uh, share a little bit about yourself and maybe um, what you found to be most beneficial uh, about the virtual program um, and w where you are now? She might have stepped away. 
Um, let me see. Yeah, it looks like maybe she fell out of the the webinar. Okay, well, she can return and we'll we'll, we'll kind of us uh, create have time to hear from from Isabel too. Um, uh, I can jump to the next slide and uh, give you uh, re reiterate a lot of those great tips that Chelsea provided, and maybe provide a couple others. Um, first off, successful applicants at the CLS program are diverse. They come from a wide range of backgrounds and are excited to represent the diversity of the United States abroad. Um, you know, where you come from and your own perspective, uh, that's really important. You know, there's ways that you can kind of represent that in your application materials. The program does place an emphasis on students who are prepared for academics, academic, the academics of the program. So it's a difficult program, it's academically rigorous, um, and it's intensive. So if you can, you know, talk about how you've dealt with challenges and, you know, had to adapt to, uh, you know, demanding academic programs, then that's really beneficial. Um, there's no GPA minimum for the CLS program, but, you know, your grades are there as part of your application and we, you know, the evaluators will see like the trends um, in your studies. Uh, in your application, it's really important to show that you can succeed on CLS. This means addressing your ability to adapt, to speak um, or to study intensively and uh, your skills at adapting to a group program. So even if you've never been abroad, perhaps you've had to adapt to a new group of people, a new community, a new environment. Uh, those are gonna be relevant and you can use that in your essays. Um, you wanna be able to show uh, in your essays that you're able to you know, make decisions, um, that you have cultural flexibility and maturity. You should show that you're motivated to pursue language study after the program. No one uh, becomes fluent in a language magically in two months, so you're going to need to map out your thoughts uh, and your plan about how you're going to continue studying Turkish or Azerbaijani after the program. Uh, this doesn't mean, uh, you know, that you have to have like a, the concrete details. If you're a freshman uh, or you're a sophomore, you know, you're going to have less clear idea of what kind of resources are, are going to be available down the line. But you should try to get some ideas uh, in your application about where, where you're going to study it. Um, maybe your campus doesn't offer courses in Turkish or Azerbaijani, but you should have a plan about, you know, what resources you can access, you know, in theory, after the program to keep working on your language skills. And finally, and most importantly, you need to make a really clear and strong connection between Turkish or Azerbaijani and your career plans. Um, how does CLS or Azerbaijani, how does Azerbaijani or Turkish intersect with your uh, ideas about work or your academic plans. Uh, you know, if it's related to your academic research you want to do, that's relevant. But you should have thoughts about how you can use your language professionally down the road. Um, perhaps not a specific job, uh, but you should be able to think about a field of employment. Or, you know, if it is a, um, a specific job, then, you know, uh, you might have thoughts about you know, where that would be. Would it be in the United States? Would it be overseas? So feel free to kind of um, start thinking about that now because uh, the more you have developed that and the more you have put thought into that, the stronger your application is going to be. Um, the application is open now and it's due November 16th at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Um, here's the timeline on what happens after you apply. So in late January 2022, every applicant is going to be notified about whether they advance to the semifinalist round or whether they've been their application has been declined. Um, the semifinalist uh, evaluation then happens and we notify participants in uh, usually um, early March about their final status. Um, your final status would either be finalist, alternate or declined candidate. If you're an alternate, this means you're sort of in a holding position, holding pattern, and you get the opportunity, you can be promoted to a finalist if one of those finalists declines the scholarship opportunity. Um, we notify all of this through email, so make sure that you have a valid email address when you apply. This email address should be valid next year too, so if you're graduating and your email account's going to close down, use a different email address when you apply. Um, like I said, we, we notify in early March of final status uh, for finalists, alternate candidates, or decline candidates. Uh, if you're a finalist, you have about two weeks to make your decision. 
Um, and if you decline at that point, we would just notify alternate candidates. And we continue to promote alternate candidates basically as late as we can up to the beginning of the program. Now, if that's an in-person program, it's harder because we have to think about visa applications and things like that. But for virtual programs, we were promoting uh, alternate candidates right up until the beginning of the program. Um, here on this slide is the website where you can apply. You've probably gone on there and looked at the application already and familiar, familiarized yourself with it. Um, I'm going to jump to the Q&A now, uh, and then I want to get through the questions we have in the, the chat box quickly so that if you have broader, more open-ended questions for Chelsea or Isabel, you can go ahead and ask them uh, too. So uh, get, keep those in mind. I'm going to answer some of these questions from the chat box. We have a question that says, does CLS give priority to students who do not speak any other languages? Uh, is that a factor in the application process? Would a student learning his or her first foreign language be prioritized over someone who's learning their second or third? Um, short answer is no. Um, uh, I think that we put together a competitive application. Um, sometimes evaluators might look at your study abroad experience or your experience with international travel. If you've had a lot of study abroad experiences or international travel experiences, uh, then it might be on you to talk about that a little bit. Like, how was that formative to you? Did you get anything from that? If they see a huge list of countries that you've traveled to, but you don't have anything to say about any of those experiences, that might have them scratch their head a little bit and say like, well, why aren't they talking about their experiences? Did they get anything from them? Um, but as far as your question, no. I think that um, you know, knowing different languages or studying different languages doesn't really have a bearing on how your application will be evaluated. Successful in it. Um, that's something you could also a point you could also make in your essays. Uh, next question from Brittany: What were? Um, oh, actually, that's an alumni question. Uh, so I'll skip that, and we can return to that in just a moment. Um, would Turkey and Azerbaijan likely be open for international travel in summer 2022? Uh, we don't know. Um, if you want to get a, a good idea of what the situation looks like in Turkey and Azerbaijan now and in the uh, coming months, I recommend going to the U.S. Department of State travel advisory pages for those countries. Um, there's a, a rating system uh, and levels of uh, risk. Uh, there's level four, level three, level two, level one. Level one is, is, is minimal risk. So um, you can go ahead and go and look uh, in the coming months to get an idea of the trend. Uh, they take a lot of their information from the CDC. So you can also go to the CDC's website for each of these countries. Um, there is a question about the travel level advisory for these countries. Um, what level would it have to be at for have, to have programming? Uh, I, I apologize, I don't know that. Um, this decision is made internally with the US Department of State. However, I, I do know that four is the highest level of risk. Um, uh, as someone focused in language study, um, oh, these are alumni questions. Does experience an in intensive language course outside of CLS show an aptitude for adapting to a new culture? Uh, question from Victor. Well, I would say, um, that you can make an argument for this in your in, in your essay. Um, so, you know, that sounds like it might be a different academic culture, intensive language studies. Um, but you, you know, if you're talking about a different world culture, you might need to make an argument in the essay about why. Did you have international teachers? Were you exposed to different cultural traditions? Uh, but yes, Victor, this is an argument you could probably develop in your essays. Um, Okay, so um, we have a question from Brittany. How can we contact alumni to get more specific information about a program? Maybe someone who has similar interest to what we want to do in the future. I recommend you go to the um, CLS website and look for alumni, alumni ambassadors. You can look at their profiles on there and you can get an idea about um, their interests, what led them to apply for the each language, what they're doing now, and really they connect the dots between, you know, the interest in the language and the professional application of it. And um, so um, if you want to get in touch with those, I believe you can get in touch with alumni ambassadors via the website. Uh, if you can't find their email contact uh, on the CLS website, go ahead and email uh, us, CLS, CLS scholarship uh, at AmericanCouncils.org, 
and we can get you in touch with an alumni ambassador who's active and who can um, answer any questions you might have. Okay. Um, great. Um, uh, here's a question for Isabel uh, and Chelsea. Um, uh, maybe uh, we could hear uh, from each of you. Um, it's a good question for Brittany. What, were, what did you do um, to ask for clarification if you did not understand parts of the cultural activities? Like a specific session, section or topic that you did not understand at all, were you able to ask for rephrasing so that you could understand? And just jump in, uh, Chelsea or Isabel, if, if you have any thoughts about how to ask for clarification uh, during some of those cultural activities. Um, so to reiterate, if I understand correctly, it's to, I'm assuming the individual is inquiring how we can ask if something is unclear during the tour or the excursion in the, in the, the target language, correct? Is that am mm -hmm. I understanding? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, well, that's a very good question because if you're an entry level, if you're a beginner level versus more advanced or medi intermediate, it can be challenging, of course, learning a language you don't know. What I have done myself and have observed as well for individuals who are at the beginning level, when you don't understand something, and that is going to happen, there's going to be a lot of things you don't understand. Um, but what the best way to communicate is uh, body language, um, holding on to a few words, picking up a few words. If one desires to carry a pocket dictionary on you, if you hear a word and you don't know the word, you ask the word. So I recommend the first words you learn your first week is the word what and what is this? I don't understand. Uh, example, please. I would recommend learning those your first week because when you have those as default words, then you're able to say that uh, if you hear a word you don't know or if you hear, um, if you wanna say something or you point at something and say, how do you say this? Like you can say that in the language, point at it and say, how do I say this? What is this? Um, that would be my advice starting off. The excursions, I, CLS does a great job in providing events and excursions that are enriching. They're somewhat challenging because you have to engage with the language, but at the same time, they're not exhausting. You will be tired, but they will design a way where if you're at the advanced versus the beginner level, they will make it to a point where you're able to engage um, and get something out of it. So, but you must understand that learning languages is an, an ongoing process and um, not having all those tools at once is, is, is okay and it's normal. I'll say also in my experience, we had uh, two different sessions. So we had the beginner intermediate and uh, intermediate advanced section for the excursions. And um, prior to them, we had uh, lists of important words to know and um, my go-to phrase is, can you please repeat that? So um, yeah, I think that CLS does do a great job of making sure that uh, you at least are able to take something away from the cultural excursion, no matter your language ability. Great, thank you. That, those are both great uh, tips. You know, I think just getting out there and, and not being shy to sort of ask for clarification and you know, use the user language skills, even if they're rudimentary, um, really can, can uh, be beneficial um, and help you uh, get through a lot of hurdles. Um, we had a question um, um, for uh, alumni that would be good to answer. I think, let's see here. Um, Chelsea, can you explain uh, about how you chose to decline the scholarship for one year and then reapply? Um, do you have thoughts about uh, your waiting until your PhD versus MA or applying an undergrad? What helped you more? Uh, so the CLS program was very, very different. It came out actually during my undergrad. And at that point, which I think is great now, they don't require a GPA requirement. At that point, the GPA was very rigid and I was under the GPA requirement. So I unfortunately did not uh, was not encouraged to apply in my undergrad. Um, so if you can in your undergrad, I highly recommend it sooner the better because one, you just get exposure to applying as well as CLS is great. So I, I, I would say the sooner the better. So if you're an undergrad, apply. 
if you are in a master's program or a PhD program, apply. If you, I would say if you apply now in your undergrad, if you're in your undergrad for the person who inquired, I'm assuming you are, um, this would be great because you would then have, if you are accepted, have an experience and something to talk about in your applications for graduate school. And it could even influence or inspire you to think about what you want to do in your master's or PhD program potentially in the future. So I strongly encourage um, anyone who is thinking about CLS to apply because you never know. There's also students I have met on the CLS program who are part of the two-year associates programs at community colleges who've also applied. Um, and they said that that experience was very enriching and, and gave them more direction in what they want to do in their undergrad as well as their graduate studies. So I hope that answered the question. Please let me know if I did not. Nope. Yeah, I think that that answered pretty well. Um, yeah, it's, you know, I, I, I can emphasize and um, uh, echo Chelsea's answer. I think that CLS is a, a great program for uh, beginners. It's a great program for um, students and, and people who have not traveled abroad before because the program provides a lot of support. So um, I would say don't wait, you know, um, uh, I'm always of the opinion you should just apply for lots of things and have options. So um, CLS is always a great option um, because it sometimes opens doors uh, down the road um, that, you know, yeah, you might you might be valuing at, in grad school or, or a PhD level. So doing it earlier in your in your studies can be really beneficial. Victor asks, is it possible to turn down a virtual CLS offer in exchange for another in person opportunity in the future uh, or would one have to reapply from the beginning? And the answer is, um, yes, you, you would have to reapply in the following year. Um, uh, if you turn down CLS virtual, um, it will not reflect poorly at all on your application in the following year, um, but you would have to reapply. Um, and that's fine. It's natural. We understand that some students want to do the in-person program and may, may be less motivated to the virtual program. That's not going to reflect poorly on you at all. Um, Brittany asks, uh, as someone focused in language study, especially concerning your Russian and Turkish learning, um, uh, what did this program allow you to bring to your research and to your students? Um, and this question might be uh, directed to you, Chelsea. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So um, I will reiterate to ensure that I understood correctly. Your question from what I understand is you want to know what the advantage was in adding Azerbaijani to the current list of languages I know and what that brought towards my students I taught as well as my research. Did I understand correctly? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay, good. So for me specifically, as I mentioned earlier, um, I'm a Eurasianist. I'm a, I'm a geographer. I specialize in population dynamics and GIS. So I make maps. I'm a cartographer, classic cartographer, and I specialize in Eurasia. So the Caucasus specifically. Um, I formally learned Azer uh, Turkish actually before Azerbaijani and um, Russian and Azerbaijani I picked up actually colloquially uh, working in the Caucasus. So for me, um, it is more of Azerbaijani was critical for me because I was specifically researching Azerbaijan in my dissertation. So in order for me to say I'm an expert in Azerbaijan and in the Caucasus, I needed to know Azerbaijani language uh, for that reason, as I would argue. Some may disagree, but I argue that. The second reason is actually because the census data, the population data, the national data in um, the website that you can get publicly, it's only available in Azerbaijani. Uh, some of it is in English, but a lot of it is in Azerbaijani. Now, unlike the other former Soviets like Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, they have things in Russian, English, and their, their native language. So for me, even though I knew Russian, it wasn't going to help me in my research for Azerbaijan. Um, Russian does help when I do research in uh, things that are more Soviet period focused on Azerbaijan. Um, so it made sense in that context. And, and currently now finishing my PhD, I, I have this past summer worked on a government internship and my language skills actually in these languages have been vital to what I have to do in my research given the translation work and the things I need to find. So uh, that I'm a unique case in the context of being specialized highly in that. But if you are interested in learning multiple languages that have a regional focus or that have a connection of um, 
similarities, I strongly encourage you to pursue that or to investigate more. And, and you're most welcome to contact me as well. Questions post seminar and Bo has my contact information and I'm sure he can, um, he knows how to find me. So he can get you my contact information if you have more specific questions about graduate school or about um, why I have a collection of these languages. Great, thank you, Chelsea. Um, and you know, uh, thank you for all your uh, insights and sharing from your experience and um, joining us today. Thank you, Isabel, too, uh, for joining us um, and providing your perspective on your experiences in the virtual program. I'm, I'm really, I hope it really kind of gave you an idea of of this, the relative strengths of of both the in-person program but the virtual program too. Um, uh, we're going to wrap up. Um, if you have questions that were unanswered here or that you wanted to talk through in more detail, do reach out to CLS scholarship at AmericanCouncils.org. Um, you can uh, ask language particular questions uh, in that email and they will get forwarded to me. They will get forwarded to the, to the people who can best answer those questions. Um, I really hope that you apply for the CLS Turkish or Azerbaijani program. Uh, they're, they're great institutes. Um, and I always have great experiences working with participants on program uh, as they go through the process uh, preparing and then you know, reaping the benefits of language gains. Um, so um, uh, remember November 16th is the deadline to apply and uh, we really hope to see your applications um, and good luck. Thanks everybody for joining. I'm gonna log out. And uh, have a great day. Bye-bye.